Well, welcome everyone back to Thinking Space. Um, I'd just like to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're on today, the Gadigal people of the New York Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal people or Torres Strait Islanders um, who are either in the room with us today or joining us on the Zoom. Um, and I'd like to extend that respect as well um, to anyone else. Um, so I'll just advise that this session will be recorded and available to rewatch on our YouTube channel um, at a later date. Um, but I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, um, Dr. Billy Hayworth from the School of Geosciences. So Billy is a geographer with expertise in critical human geography, geographic information systems, and international disaster studies and humanitarianism, um, and their main research areas over the past decade. Um, have included the role of volunteer geographic information, social media, um, participatory mapping in bushfire emergency preparedness in Australia, environmental livelihood, um, security, spatial information in the Asia Pacific region, um, reading graffiti in conflict affected societies, um, and queer disaster vulnerability and resilience, um, including the studies of LGBTQIA plus um, experiences of COVID in Brazil and the UK. Um, but today, um, he'll be speaking to us about disasters and vulnerabilities and looking at spaces of LGBTQIA+, um, margin marginality and resistance. So I'll hand over to you to take it away. Great, thank you. Um, there's a lot of acronyms in there. Um, <laughs> and I actually was going to talk about myself and then I dumped that slide in the interest of time. So that's a nice surprise that you can just talk about me. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, and I think the last time I spoke in Thinking Space was maybe 2016 or maybe, I think. So, thanks for having me back. Um, so, before I start, I want to give a bit of a content warning. So, while I'll be doing so in an academic way and I'm not going to be showing any graphic details or anything like that, but I will be discussing some pretty distressing themes, including homophobia and transphobia gender-based violence, discrimination against LGBTQI plus people in various ways. So if you feel you don't want to be exposed to that today, by all means, do whatever you need to do to keep yourself safe and okay. And if you want to discuss anything with me afterwards or find some readings or resources, then I'd be happy to do that. Uh, in line with that, for a similar reason, I'm going to read from my notes a lot more than I would usually prefer to. Um, mostly just to keep myself on track because as a queer person doing this kind of work, sometimes I have a tendency to get emotional as well and ramble about certain things that, you know, we should stick with in our 40 minutes or whatever. Um, okay, so. Nothing's happening. So this talk is really based on a book chapter that somebody asked me to write um, and I thought, yep, I can do that. So the Handbook of Sexualities in Space, and the section on crisis and resistance, and they asked me to write something about disasters and vulnerabilities. And I hadn't written that when I nominated to do this talk, but I now have, so thanks for the you know, <laughs> Um So that's what I'm gonna talk about. And so I should also just acknowledge um, Michael McGrath is a colleague from a, former position I had working at an LGBTQI plus NGO who helped me write some of this um, talk. So there is a growing but still small um, body of literature that documents the varied ways in which lesbian, by, uh, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, asexual and other gender and sexual minority identity people or LGBTQI plus experience heightened vulnerabilities during crisis and disasters, as well as to a lesser extent their resilience Qualities. And so in this talk, I'm going to use this acronym LGBTQIA plus and also the word queer. And I'm using both of those um, as kind of umbrella terms for all people with diverse sexual orientations, gender identities and expressions, and sex characteristics. But I say that to also recognize that LGBTQIA plus is biased towards Western notions of gender and sexuality, and that there are many local and cultural concepts of sexual and gender identity in the world. And so LGBTQI plus and queer are used here without prejudice to the diverse ways that individuals and communities may 
uh, identify themselves in their own um, in their own lives and contexts. And I also am aware that uh, in describing a whole population group together, such as LGBTQI+, um, that I, I am in some way homogenizing them in a, a lot of diversity into to one umbrella group. Um, but I do acknowledge uh, the vast diversity and intersectional identities and experiences among queer people. So in this talk, I'm trying to highlight some individual experiences and also some community-wide phenomena that we can understand through particular spaces. Um, and some of the processes that are put on those people, however they identify, things like homophobia and transphobia, um, based on those identities. But I really acknowledge that you know, individual people may or may not um, align with some of the experiences or themes I'm talking about. So before we go further, I also thought I should just briefly talk about some of the terms I'm going to use a lot so that we understand what I mean by them in this context. So a disaster, um, I think about disaster beyond the kind of popular understanding of a natural hazard, like a fire or an earthquake or a flood, but as any significant disruption to the kind of normal functioning of a society. And society I'm also using really broadly or loosely here, which could be a population group, it could be a, you know, a whole city or a country, um, but it could just be a particular community, which could be spread quite across the world but affected in certain ways. Um, so, and in terms of a disaster, there are a number of elements that would make that um, eventuate. So risk is more than just, just the hazard, um, but it includes exposure and also vulnerability and resilience. So if this, fire, if this building were to have a fire and we would evacuate, maybe unfortunately some people were injured, that might be an emergency, but it's not a disaster on the kind of scale I'm talking about, but we have kind of larger amounts of people and processes and you know, functions of society being um, disrupted. So then, uh, so I said vulnerability and resilience. So disaster risk and the impacts on populations are products of vulnerability. And in this case, um, using vulnerability to refer to the notion that pre-existing societal conditions generate systemic inequalities and marginalization that result in greater and uneven risk for some groups and individuals. And the inability of all people to cope with risk is ultimately a consequence of vulnerability emerging from long-term processes, result, um, including things like political decisions, ideologies, governance, prejudices, power relations, the availability, availability of resources and choices to particular people. And in most societies, uh, more dominant groups make decisions for others. And so that can lead to this kind of um, social and economic marginalization, um, which leads to greater vulnerability in times of crisis. And the vulnerabilities of marginalized groups, including LGBTQIA plus people, are made worse by choices, sometimes active, but often subconscious, of policymakers and disaster managers, uh, in this case, to exclude them from disaster risk reduction and emergency response strategies. And then critical disaster scholarship also recognizes the endogenous resilience and resistance capacities of marginalized groups during disasters, and that includes queer populations. And so in this context, I'm referring to resilience as the ability of individuals or communities to withstand, resist, or cope with potential disruptions presented by hazards or crises. So again, I'm keeping that quite broad. Um, it is related to, but is not the opposite of vulnerability. So one may be vulnerable in some ways, but simultaneously resilient in others. For example, someone who rents their home without insurance may be vulnerable to becoming homeless um, if their house burns down in a fire but they may be resilient in other ways. Maybe they've got strong social capital and friends and family they could, they could seek out. So those things are related, but, but not to say that one means uh, the other can't be true. And so in this talk, I'll be talking a lot about both vulnerability and resilience of LGBTQI plus people. So to maybe get us thinking about what that means in a kind of real world context, um, about the kind of marginality of queer people, um, vulnerable or experiencing some inequalities in a crisis. I'm just going to show you a, a video, it's about three and a half minutes, um, which is something I produced as part of research when I was at the University of Manchester during COVID in 2020, where we were interviewing people um, during lockdowns in the UK and Brazil about their experiences, and this was a way to communicate some of those experiences. <laughs> 
LGBT plus communities are often isolated from their families, and they may have lost friends in coming out. Many move to an area because they think it's going to be a happier place to live. So when you say to them, stay home, don't go to LGBT plus spaces, to your community groups, they're finding themselves very isolated and very lonely and depressed. Lloyd moved here seeking to be part of a community. And then all of a sudden he was shut off completely, which has taken a big toll on his mental health. In Brazil, the financial crisis is making many people like Laura feel unstable mentally, as she's worried about getting fired and maybe not even having enough to eat at some point. She says being a black woman, she faces race and gender issues when seeking work, while being lesbian doesn't affect her as much because she keeps her personal and professional relationships separate. A lot of Prince's health procedures are on hold. If COVID hadn't happened, they would have had top surgery this summer. It's obviously been pushed back, but they haven't been told anything and they're heartbroken. After coming out at the age of 22, Prince had a personal goal that a lot of their medical transition would have been done by the time they were 30. But that's now become a very difficult hurdle. Mauro has always limited his circle of friends due to being LGBT+. As he came out when he was nearly 30, he says that in Brazil there are things happening that he's terrified of. Discourses of hatred and violence. And that everyone is feeling particularly fragile during the pandemic. Mauro has been especially impacted by the reduced social network due to the stigma of being LGBT+. LGBT plus Muslims, life can be isolating because being gay often isn't accepted in their families and communities. Omar works for an organization that supports them, and with COVID, they're now creating community online, such as through a pride event with countries like Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Omar says there were people saying, wait a minute, I'm in Saudi Arabia, it's 3 a.m., and I'm actually at a pride. And those involved in running the events and being able to help others say that it has kept them going during COVID. The University of Manchester studies key recommendations are to involve LGBT plus people in response and policy making, prioritize access to disrupted LGBT plus services, allocate resources to support work already being done, develop international standards to improve responses, provide education and training on LGBT plus issues, and focus on risk reduction. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about that work directly, but some of those stories might come up again later. And with that, um, like other work in this space, the intention was really just to highlight the experiences of people in terms of some inequalities and the struggles they were facing, but also how they were coping with those. But what I really didn't um, go into any detail in that, and which I've argued in another paper that should be considered, is the notion of space and how that those experiences change um, across spaces and how spaces themselves are vulnerable and so on in relation to LGBTQA plus people. And so that's what um, this I thought I would do, you know, in this chapter. Um, so I guess starting from some idea about what or how space conceptually is is going to inform the rest of my discussion. Vulnerability is not produced or experienced in the same ways everywhere, with space informing access to resources, policies, and decision-making processes that shape inclusion and exclusion. And so geography is um, inherently linked to politics and the processes and structures that produce vulnerability. And the construction of all spaces, prosaic places such as work, streets, venues, and discursive spaces, the nation, law, politics, is informed by normative constructions of sexuality and gender. And so consequently, the personal safety, risk, and vulnerability of LGBTQI plus people are informed by space. 
And then also socially constructed and relational um, aspects of space. I mean, the space shapes marginalization in changing spatio-temporal contexts, including during disasters. Stigma as a marginalizing uh, process, which is salient for LGBTQI plus uh, people, populations, is shaped by social processes of power, identity, and space. Social meanings and conditions of space Spaces shape risk and risk perceptions associated with different identities and stigma therefore differs across geographic locations and within single spaces when the context changes. For example, when a physical space um, is disrupted by disaster and, and privacy is impacted. Um, and additionally, people are not passive, of course, in, in how they use and navigate spaces and marginalized people reconstruct space through how they navigate, respond to, and are resilient against normative constructions, dominations, and oppressions. And those are some of the themes that I'm going to um, try and embed with uh, thinking about three spaces of importance in particular, to the division for their plus people for both their everyday and disaster vulnerability and resilience. And so um, recognizing the politicized nature of space and changes in and to spaces, um, I'll be talking about disaster and emergency shelters, nightclubs, and uh, the internet as spaces. And so why am I talking about those? Um, they are different in many ways, um, but they each represent spaces of refuge and escape and also violence and loss simultaneously. And the combination of these particular spaces um, allows us to dissect these themes in um, first a temporary localized physical context, which is emergent from a specific event, so a, a disaster shelter, a more permanent localized physical context of importance to everyday lives, in this case, the nightclubs, and then a virtual context that expands beyond spatial and temporal boundaries with cross-cutting and changing functions, in this case, the internet. And so I'm using international literature um, on LGBTQI plus disaster experiences, as well as some of my own theoretical and empirical research, and also drawing on professional experience working um, on LGBTQI plus projects um, in the disaster humanitarian NGO space, as I mentioned uh, previously. And um, we use those experiences and those, those literatures and sources to explore themes of stigma, violence, safety, and community. And so I'm aiming to demonstrate, um, hopefully, that not only um, are people vulnerable, but uh, spaces are vulnerable as well. And also to show how those same spaces can be leveraged for resistance against the marginalization that contributes to that vulnerability. So first, to disaster emergency shelters. So disaster shelters perform significant uh, functions um, immediately and, and sort of longer term following a disaster, um, functions of safety, protection, accommodation, and providing medical and other uh, services. They provide immediate relief and temporary accommodation, but can also be a starting place for longer term housing and rehabilitation and also trauma uh, recovery. Disaster shelters used for the kind of immediate emergency response and short term recovery um, for displaced um, people are the focus of my talk, not those kind of longer term maybe housing projects or whatever it may be. So, and these sort of short-term shelters take a range of structural forms, including plastic sheets, tents, prefabricated units, and are often temporarily, repur temporarily repurposed uh, public buildings. So sports facilities, schools, community halls, and also religious uh, buildings. And so disaster shelter definitions often include um, notions of safety, of course, but also privacy and dig dignity. However, research into shelters highlights uh, failings in delivering on those aims for all people, and disaster-affected communities are often homogenized, resulting in ineffective one-size-fits-all approaches to shelter provision that overlook social inequalities. And so in terms of LGB LGBTQI plus people and shelters, Shelters have delivered relief from the immediate impacts of hazards, of course, including for LGBTQI plus people. Um, but they've also been spaces um, of documented homophobic and transphobic violence and discrimination. So as some examples, Dodge reported on transgender people being harassed when attempting to use shelter bathrooms after Hurricane Katrina hit the United States Gulf Coast in 2005. Dominic Howes and others described LGBTQI plus vulnerability in the 2010 Haiti earthquake shelters, where, quote, 
lesbians, bisexual women and transgender and intersex people were subject to gender-based violence and corrective rape. Jones revealed how some men who have sex with men and transgender women were excluded from shelters during flooding in Malawi when places of worship, where homosexuality is condemned, were repurposed as shelters. And this narrative for this um, narrative of blame of LGBTQI plus people um, um, in some places it is quite common um, in relation to religion. So because of the sins against God, they are the ones who caused the flood. Um, and so Jones, um, Nicola was one of my PhD students in Manchester and that's her work. Um, so some of the key drivers of these experiences and vulnerability in shelters include um, social, socio-political norms, so cis-normativity and hetero-normativity. Uh, so these uh, kind of briefly refer to the widespread acceptance that as default, everyone identifies as the sex they were assigned at birth and that everyone is heterosexual. And so safe access to shelters and disaster risk reduction more broadly is dictated by these socio-political norms. And a key one here for shelters is, is the Western and binary gender assumption that everyone is either male or female. And so um, as some examples of where that's become problematic, population group in India who do not conform to a binary gender system, the Aravanis, were excluded from shelters following the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami because relief was issued based on male and female genders. Similar experiences were recorded in Samoa, where members of the Fafafine population felt discriminated against in shelters and bathrooms following Cyclone Evan in 2012, despite being recognised as making significant community contributions in, uh, uh, to reduce disaster impacts. In Indonesia, during the 2010 Mount Merapi uh, eruption response, shelter staff only recorded evacuees as women, men, girls or boys, and uh, um, sort of third gender cultural group, the warriors, um, avoided shelters consequently, fearing discrimination, preferring to seek help from their friends. While outside relief agencies may be equipped to construct shelters, these examples highlight that they often aren't guided by local populations and needs, or cultural, political, economic, and geographic realities. And I also wanna make the point that reports highlight there's a lot of diversity of LGBTQI plus shelter experiences, and that these spaces are not equal even within marginalized groups, um, which maybe is pretty obvious, but I think worth saying. So experiences vary according to lots of things, so social treatment, intersections with other forms of oppression, personal preferences, and um, as some examples, um, Dwyer and uh, Wolf talk about um, uh, interviews post-tropical cycle in Winston in Fiji, um, talk about some of those differences. And so I'll just read a quote. One lesbian who did lots of stereotypically men's work in her community expressed a desire to stay in an evacuation center with men as she felt more comfortable with them than she did with village women who were more hostile towards her. Some gay men felt comfortable using shelters with heterosexual men, while other gay men said they would never do that for fear of discrimination and violence. Some trans women said that they would be more comfortable with cisgender women, while other trans women said they would be uncomfortable. Urban participants highlighted that some sexual and gender minority members will seek support from each other rather than community shelter. The shelters have also been associated with forced coming outs or the fear of um, being outed. So for some, they represent the opposite of what they were, were intended to uh, be. So spaces of safety, but also privacy and dignity. And um, Umamiya described shelters in the aftermath of the Great East Japan uh, disaster as large spaces like gymnasiums, which were seismic resistant spaces, but they provided no privacy, um, with evacuees attempting to construct their own partitioning screens using cardboard boxes. The government did later provide um, partitions, but they were only high enough to block vision if you were seated. And, and in that context, um, a transgender man was interviewed by Umamiya, who um, was wearing a chest compression shirt at the time of evacuation. He was forced to wear it for several days without washing, and distress and anxiety about his body odour and how his gender was perceived by others increased. Eventually, the man returned to his damaged home to change clothes, and thereby placing himself in a, a risky situation away from the somewhat physical um, safety of the shelter to avoid changing in public or continuing to wear the uncomfortable chest compression shirt. 
And so forced coming out is not only related to private places that become open, but uh, Yama Shifra and others also talk about forced coming out as a process that leaves human beings bare, viscerally open for everybody to see, appraise and judge. And so these experiences highlight the vulnerability of some LGBTQI plus people through forced exposure to others in ways that don't happen in other spaces and how vulnerability in both physically and socially constructed, for example, by who else is in that space, um, is, uh, is a contributor to, to their experiences following a disaster in a negative way and privacy access being a key indicator of safety for marginalized groups. And, and, that's, uh, and here I return to, to um, Nicola Jones's work on HIV stigma, power and identity in disaster context as being instructive. So Jones described how people with HIV routinely employ strategies to avoid, reduce and or challenge stigma and how strategic disclosure involves assessments of contextual risks and benefits. People have agency over how they perform their identities, concealing, revealing and or essentializing specific attributes to achieve particular goals at particular times. And so space and privacy shape people's ability to strategically respond to stigma. When privacy is compromised, higher risk strategies may be adopted to avoid stigma and discrimination, as was the case with the man who we had described in returning to his home um, to avoid uh, changing his clothes in public. And in this context, though, um, there are also stories of LGBTQ plus people in community groups demonstrating um, disaster resilience capacities, which have been developed through the same everyday marginalization that contributes to the vulnerability such as being able to identify risks, develop strategies to ensure safety for themselves and their peers. And so as an example, following the 2015 Nepal earthquake disaster, um, an LGBTQI plus community organization in Nepal, the Blue Diamond Society, um, established a separate camp for transgender and people of non-binary gender identities, free of the violence present in existing shelters normatively designed for cisgender males and females. And that is a unique example um, because not all groups or people will have the mobilization or resources to, to do such a thing. And I guess arguably they should have to. Okay, moving on to nightclubs. So where shelters provide relief in contexts where stability has been upheaved, by design, queer nightclubs are spaces in which the upheaval of the status quo is the very thing being sought. So while LGBTQI plus people can be forced to conceal their identities in their homes or their workplaces and other public venues, queer nightclubs um, often function as safe havens and substitute homes where LGBTQI plus people find safety through things as basic as feeling safe to use the toilet, not feeling other, and rejoicing in shared experiences and respect for difference. The queer nightclubs, um, Therefore, by design, are sites of resistance to the historic and contemporary social, economic, and political marginalization faced by LGBTQI plus people in everyday life. And things that, that happen in these spaces, like social connectedness um, and capacity of self organization, networking, being adaptive, these things are all key parts of disaster resilience. And so, arguably, these spaces are important in, in building those capacities for when the crisis does occur. And uh, Madison Moore describes the queer nightclub entrance as, quote, a portal, a door, or a teleportation to another universe that we slip through to access other sides of ourselves and other heightened states of being. Through the portal, you find yourself in a place where time doesn't even exist, but actually turns off, stops. Once on the other side, you can focus on joy, experience, relationships, and community. And so in their demarcation of the permissibility of identities and behaviours that defy the cis-heteronormative world outside, nightclubs are inherently political spaces whose doors are, quote, <laughs> used to keep people out who would otherwise police the freedom within the space. The relative uh, safety of nightclubs, however, is itself vulnerable. So during disasters and major crises, nightclubs may become physically uh, inaccessible, removing the important space of refuge and resistance for LGBTQI plus populations. So access to these queer spaces was disrupted during the COVID-19 pandemic around the world, um, for, for instance. Um, and of course, that was due to perceived risks associated with in-person gatherings, um, 
and and that may make sense uh, kind of epidemiologically, epidemiologically um, in terms of risk management. Um, but it meant people were excluded from community spaces, support groups, their networks, and so on. So pride festivals, um, nightclubs, um, and other spaces were all um, closed. And so Lindsay is a transgender woman in, in the UK who also works as a drag and cabaret performer. Um, Describe the loss of nightclub spaces um, and what they meant to her. And they're really disrupted not having clubs to go to to release the tension of existing in a very cisgendered heterosexual society and needing to escape. So on top of losing work, I also lost a place to truly express myself. And so I'm not arguing that, that these spaces shouldn't have been closed during the height of the pandemic. Um, but at least in the UK, other spaces did open before these sorts of spaces. So things like gyms or restaurants or religious um, places and so on. And maybe that's fine too. But there did seem to be a kind of hierarchy in which places were privileged over others that didn't make a lot of epidemiological sense. And it may also be that nightclubs still need to be closed for longer if there is some reason for that. But then what could governments or crisis responders do to provide alternative places for these people to meet and express themselves and, and so on. So, so that's the kind of gap I'm getting at. I'm not suggesting that there wasn't a good reason to close the clubs. Um, so even when queer nightclubs remain physically accessible, they can become dangerous for LGBTQI plus people owing to the socially constructed nature of space. So the safety of nightclubs can be rendered uh, precarious and fragile when those seeking to enforce ideals of the outside world cross the threshold. Violent, hate-motivated acts transform the act of queer, act of public queer identification and congregation from a feature of safety to one of danger. And so the 2016 massacre of Pulse nightclub in Orlando is perhaps the most globally um, reported on attack on an LGBTQA plus nightclub, where a lone gunman killed 49 people and injured 53. And while horrific in scale, this is not an isolated event. Six years later in Colorado Springs, a gunman stormed Club Q, a gay club, killing five and injuring two. Blatant hate-motivated crime with the perpetrator stating in his hearing, I intentionally and after deliberation caused the death of each victim. In 2017, Super Super Club in Zagreb was tear gassed by uncourt assailants and French security forces thwarted a bomb attack targeting a gay nightclub in Paris. In 2023, against a backdrop of expanding conservatism, a Christian extremist group dubbing themselves the Soldiers of God ransacked a drag event at a queer bar in Beirut, and in a video of their bashing of patrons proclaimed, we will not allow the promotion of homosexuality in the land of God. And there are more that I'm not going to keep reading because I won't be able to. So in each of these cases, LGBTQA plus people were vulnerable for the very fact that they're publicly uh, convening in a place that was designed for them. So thus the intent of the inflicted violence is to transform these venues into spaces of danger. And research conducted uh, regarding the Pulse attack in particular illustrates that the nightclub attacks can have communal impacts upon LGBTQI plus perceptions of safety. And I guess this is where I start to consider perhaps an isolated or not, but a, a single nightclub attack as a disaster in these kind of wider effects that it has. So surveys of self-identifying LGBTQI plus Americans in the weeks after the attack found that perceptions of safety declined, particularly amongst the most marginalised sexual and gender identities. And in this survey, that was genderqueer, queer, or non-identified slash other. With the authors concluding that the event impacted the worldview, meaning-making, and post-traumatic adjustment of wider LGBTQI plus communities. Others demonstrated the physiological toll that the massacre had on, on LGBTQI plus people in Colorado Springs by tracking heightened adrenocortical responses among adults in the months after the incident. Another study revealed that individuals across the country were less likely to attend gay bars after the Pulse shooting, particularly if they came from a place of higher structural stigma. So evidence and studies are limited on other attacks, but both the intent and outcome of hate-motivated violence against queer nightclubs are clear, to transform these spaces that were designed to be refuges and havens into spaces to be feared. And this precarity of LGBTQI plus spaces highlights again the everyday marginality and violence faced by many queer people, which in turn involves uh, disaster vulnerability. Okay, this one 
<laughs> it's like less traumatic for me. Um, the internet. Um, so the internet as a space is um, typically conceptualized with two main functions. So one is in information space, so presentation and consumption of information on websites, streaming platforms. The other is communication space, typically um, identified as through activities associated with Web 2.0, so the fact that we can contribute to the internet as well as receive things, and interactions through social networking applications. Both spaces are virtual, interfolded, and typically accessed through screens, while information space is, is uh, important in this um, piece, I'm mainly interested in the communication space element and how the possibilities and consequences of interpersonal and social engagement through the internet contribute to LGBTQI plus disaster vulnerability and resilience opportunities. So studies recorded during COVID worsening mental health of people living in lockdowns or under state home orders as probably all aware, um, and that includes among LGBTQI plus populations. Um, but a key source of predicted and observed distress for queer people was uncomfortable or unsafe homes and more time spent with uns unsupportive origin families. So the internet and social media provider uh, proved in this context to be a valuable space for LGBTQI plus people to engage with communities, learn about gender and sexuality, explore identities and curate their own comfortable and safe spaces, even if for or when um, home environments were difficult. And discussion of the internet also includes mobile dating and hookup apps. And Holloway and colleagues described how gay, bisexual and other men who have sex with men utilize technology to connect with social networks during COVID-19. And they emphasized um, in their study the platform Hornet, which was an app designed for gay and bisexual men of sex with men to connect with other gay and bisexual men of sex with men. They reported that almost all of their over 10,000 survey participants indicated using Hornet to ease loneliness during the pandemic, highlighting the role that such apps um, can play in aiding mental health. In the aftermath of Typhoon Haiyan in Taklavan in the Philippines, Ong demonstrated how the dating app Grinder enabled local Filipino LGBTQI plus people to explore, connect with, and experience sexual and other encounters with a new and newly diverse population of aid workers, volunteers, and other visitors to the post-disaster zone. Now, while some of the problems of LGBTQI plus dating and hookup culture, and Grinder in particular, were kind of re-highlighted, such as colonial, racial, and class hierarchies in the Philippines, that of course exist everywhere else in, in various ways, um, the internet here played a role in providing opportunities for escapism and entertainment um, for queer people following the disaster. And Ong's exploration of queer cosmopolitanism post-typhoon also provides a counter to often pessimistic interpretations of disaster recovery and power imbalances. For instance, that global humanitarian actors are dominant over local affected populations. But the internet can also be a space for unregulated abuse, discrimination, and hate rhetoric, reinforcing pre-existing marginalization during crises. So in my own research, I found that um, LGBTQI plus people in the UK and Brazil perceived increases in LGBTQI plus discrimination on social media during COVID-19, especially towards transgender and non-binary people. While online platforms helped many people cope with lockdowns, including queer people, the benefits were not shared equally, and online space was often more distressing for some people owing to the discrimination they experienced, thus kind of taking away that source of support. And that included the resurfacing of harmful HIV-related stigma towards LGBTQI plus people. And as disaster studies have long emphasized, we just see here again the pre-existing marginalization and social issues being exposed and exacerbated during the crisis to produce vulnerabilities and unequal impacts. And some have called for um, various protections, particularly for youth in this space um, online. Some have uh, called for measures to increase access and um, whilst at the same time um, protecting LGBTQI plus people online, but I haven't really seen sort of good practical answers to those questions. But the internet is also a space for resilience. Resilience qualities are also demonstrated by the way queer people use the internet um, and, and that yeah, that includes during COVID-19. And my work showed that um, queer people used online tools to support each other, including uh, in particular in the absence of adequate, more formal support or government relief. 
and individuals and community groups um, were able to reshape online spaces to be more inclusive, safe and affirming through social connectedness and empowerment. And so during the first wave of the pandemic in the UK in 2020, we found that grassroots um, queer community groups were instrumental in supporting local, national and even international LGBTQA plus communities through online events like cabaret nights or pride celebrations with the organisers um, describing those events as, uh, as running those events and running those platforms as motivation to keep them going during the pandemic. Um, and that's what we saw with Omar in that video at the start. And lastly here, um, Ogini and others have suggested that the pandemic helped foster a greater sense of community through increased internet usage, leading to new opportunities such as celebrating the first ever African Pride online. COVID-19 and innovative internet use also saw new opportunities for formal LGBTQA plus service delivery. So an example being uh, Nigerian organizations extending access to HIV treatment and sharing stress management advice online. However, it is important to remember that internet access and participation inequalities persist, of course, so there are implications for excluded marginalized populations during disasters um, as well. Okay. To finish with some perhaps unsurprising and not very sophisticated conclusions, <laughs> um, we have explored uh, LGBTQI plus marginality and resistance in three spaces that epitomize the significance of vulnerability in shaping disaster experiences. So we've seen some of the complex interactions between marginality, stigma, safety and violence and community resistance and resilience in relation to both people, both the people using spaces and the spaces themselves. So disaster shelters seek to provide refuge from immediate disaster impacts, but can be sites of unknown transphobic violence and exclusion, meaning queer people must adopt personal strategies to manage their exposure, not only to the disaster risk, but to potential discrimination. Queer nightclubs are important spaces for self-expression and resistance to cis heteronormativities that hegemonize daily life, but are also vulnerable to becoming inaccessible uh, in crises and targeted for assault, changing these spaces community, joy and resistance into spaces of despair, loss and fear. And the internet is simultaneously a space for social networking and learning about identity, especially during times of isolation, and as a space for unregulated abuse and hate rhetoric towards LGBTQA plus people. So in these ways, the vulnerability of queer people is demonstrated, as well as the vulnerability of LGBTQA plus spaces, and our discussions have highlighted how LGBTQI plus people leverage the same spaces of vulnerability to resist domination, foster community and build disaster resilience. And I guess my kind of final call to action, I suppose, is that greater consideration is needed for the importance of space as informing LGBTQI plus vulnerability and resilience in disastrous reduction research, but particularly policy and practice, whereby at, moment, at the moment, um, the kind of embedding of space into those practices is largely about where a hazard is and exposed populations, not that might include where vulnerable populations are, or you know, the presence of this particular site, like a nursing home might be a vulnerable site, but it doesn't really include anything about how space informs the vulnerability and the marginality, or using these important spaces to build on the resilience that populations might have. And I say that um, in reference to all marginalized groups, really, not just big people. Maybe that's it. A lot of references you can't read. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us, Dylan. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes left for some questions. Um, if you're on Zoom, I'll be monitoring the chat. You can also maybe pop your hand up if you'd like to ask the question yourself. Um, but we might start with people in the room. Uh, Leah? Thanks, Billy. Um, love that and love hearing um, a more formal sort of presentation of, of the play. It's great. And I love the I love that you got around about halfway through to talking more about the we are resilience, resistance, agency, power that's always in queer studies, the 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 flip side of of, of constructing family, constructing communities in the face of um, vulnerability and disaster. So love that. My question is um, I know at the beginning you described, you said you said that you're explicitly using queer and LGBTQI plus as a umbrella terms. But my question is how much does the other meaning of queer um, as a as as 
queerness um, as a way of thinking, a lens, a paradigm, an ontology? How much has that influenced your way of thinking and your way of approaching um, disaster studies? For example, I can really imagine like saying something like, you know, um, uh, for queer people, heteropatriarchy is just a continuous disaster that just continues throughout mm -hmm. life, right? And, well, not just for queer people, for everyone. But um, if we're already living in disaster, what does it mean to have disasters on top of it? So, I don't know. How... Yeah, no, of course. Is that... Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, so queer, yeah, as I said, I'm using it in this case mostly to describe a group of people, but um, yeah, the kind of doing or the kind of yeah, verb of it. Something I've also thought about, and so queer to queer something to kind of subvert something or to flip something, or um, you know, see through a queer lens rather than through a you know, dominant patriarchal cis gender lens. Um, yeah, definitely. And and at the same time as this, I was asked to write another chapter. Um, so like my current research is not really on this, but people keep asking you to keep writing stuff. So fine. And that one we started. We the intention was with a colleague uh, in the UK to. So the, the main guiding document or, or principle in disaster management is the Sendai Framework for Disasters Reduction, 2015 to 30, so the UN kind of guiding thing. And it has a section on gender, but it's it's just women and girls, um, even you know, kind of intersectional women and girls are not really included, or bisexual women are women, or you know, they're not really included, or lesbian, you know. So it's very limited. So for that other chapter, we we said let's present or try and develop. Well, let's try and queer that framework. Um, what would a properly queer, you know, disastrous reduction framework look like? And I think we wrote something meaningful that has been accepted to be in this book, but I, we did not do that and we ended up changing what we were doing because it does inform how I think about things and the kind of politics in this place of space and about, um, yeah, and, and about, you know, these, these, these factors are contributing to Kind of everyday experiences all the time regardless of their, my use in a disaster context but it felt like in a practical sense that at least in the disaster field in a kind of policy practice sense was not ready for that and i didn't know how to do it how to write that in a way that would be useful because this book was also for practitioners and policy makers not just academics um so so yeah it definitely informs my thinking all the time but you know when like I've also served as an expert advisor on gender inclusion to the UN as they've put together an, an action plan for implementing this Sendai framework in the second half in relation to gender. And every single meeting, I just kept reminding them that people are not just men or women. And it's kind of funny, but like it's not as well, you know. And in the end, that action plan, which I'm proud of being a part of it, but any of the suggestions that I and others in a similar way made were not included and I think the best we got was you know we need to advance opportunities and inclusion and etc for women in all their diversity that was a language that the UN was willing to accept so so yeah I, would, I in an academic sense you know I think this the queering of things and and that whole canon of literature is super important but in a kind of disaster practice policy sense which is where my work has more been directed um yeah, I don't know. I feel there's a way to go before I can meaningfully do something with that, but we should. Yeah. Mine's actually quite related to that. So thank you, always great and sobering at the same time. Um, so I was reflecting on some of the literature you're putting up for the disaster section and thinking about the splash this, this made in the 2010s and the 2010s. And then the kind of my sense, and this is where I want your thoughts, about it hasn't, it hasn't evolved, right? Exactly in that sense. Where, where is it? Where, where is it gone? Has it gone? Am I missing it? Tell me it's there somewhere. But where, where is it? Like, you know, 2010s, 2010s, I thought this is going to be a new fantastic direction of research. We need this. It's time. And, yes, you might be advising on your own policy documents, but where's the concurrent academic literature that's actually driving this yeah. home. I mean, I know that in some senses this, sorry for talking, it's terrible academic mistake, but I'm thinking, well, okay, it's in disasters, we react, right? So it's a disaster event and then you have the academic literature that reacts to it. But what are your thoughts about whether or not we've kind of pushed this as far as we can go? Yeah, 
Yeah, um, I yeah I agree, and it's you know in the particularly the queer disaster literature, yeah. um, you know, it's the same names all the time that are doing stuff, or I just don't know about them, and that could one hundred percent be true, particularly in other parts of you know the world where they're not in Western academic journals, maybe, but but certainly you see the same names, um, and. It feels like there was, yeah, kind of, yeah, there were some big projects, some studies reporting on these things. You know, Hurricane Katrina was a big instance, but then after that even. Um, and I don't, and then I would say uh, maybe a resurgence is during COVID, and maybe some of that is in a different place, like the, um, you know, like health um, kind of spaces or epidemiology or, you know, um, kind of public health journals and so on, rather than disaster. and. And I made a brief comment at the start, but you know, in my writing, I make a bigger point about saying why I consider COVID a disaster. So I think a lot of work has happened in that context, which I think has you know, innumerate relevant you know, findings, but they're not being called or put in disaster space. But beyond that, I, I mean, I feel like they're, even though I've said it's quite limiting and you know, the UN group, et cetera, there, I have seen some progress as well. Um, like at Sydney World Pride last year, the Australian government, um, announced developing an LGBTQI plus policy for its our international aid in particular and increased funding. I forget the number, but it was three million, but not a lot. But you know, that's more than zero. So and then I've sat on a panel last year of, you know, kind of getting people around the room to inform what that policy should be. It was maybe 15 people and one I was actually like chairing the session. So not me, but one academic. So um, so it feels like in the kind of third sector NGO policy space, maybe things have, have I don't really want to say moved on, I feel like they're catching up to what the academics said 15 years ago. <laughs> but maybe there's a bit more movement there, but that's not a really good answer, but I agree um, that, yeah, it feels like you're repeating the same thing. Like even me writing these sort of things, I was still saying we need to think about intersectionality because people aren't, you know. Um, so yeah, it's a bit frustrating. Um, I think we've got time for maybe one quick question. Um, anyone else in the room or on Zoom? Can I ask a really quick question? Are you seeing similar things apply to other vulnerable groups? Is there any movement that you could yeah. use a comparative analysis with? So I, it's not personally that I've done, but certainly in um, disability space, there's a lot of stuff, you know, the kind of, dominant processes that limit access, for example, in different ways. Um, um, and the sort of lack of inclusion in decision-making, those sorts of things. Um, and so, I mean, a bit like Joe said, I think disability disaster work had a blur, <laughs> bit of a go, you know, 15 years ago or 10 years ago. Um, I'm not saying it's still not going, uh, it's still not happening, but um, yeah. And, and even again, in that kind of policy work, it, the, the sexuality and gender, diversity stuff was always included in broader gender, um, disability inclusion, social kind of programming. Um, so, so yeah, anyway, definitely disability space. Um, and I think one thing in another paper, later this I tried to draw on was, um, well, intersectionality itself comes from kind of critical feminist race scholarship. Um, so certainly that area um, and the idea of, Kind of a more contemporary understanding of, of feminism as not being about equality but kind of liberation from the processes and structures that that shape the you know that's, that's certainly an idea that i've tried to apply to, to this context so so yeah so there are a few great well i think we might just wrap up today so let's all thank billy again <laughs> um so certainly well thank you for bringing this to our attention i guess Certainly a lot more thinking that we can do in one hour. Um, so definitely something that I'm continuing to think about um, just throughout in general. Um, I'll just highlight the next fortnight, so the 22nd of May, we've got our final thinking space of the semester. So it's our final post-grad um, session. Um, and we have two speakers from the School of Geosciences, Katie Moore and Mika Bird. Um, so thank you all for attending and I hope to see you at the next thinking space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.